Now we're going to look at um, variable control charts, which is one of the two general types of control charts. The other is attribute control charts. And the thing about variable control charts is um, there's actually pretty much three kinds, um, but generally people just use two of them. And what we do in a variable control chart is it's something that can be measured as opposed to something that can be counted. So something that can be measured is sort of like inches or microns or grams, something that you can actually have a measurement device as a continuous variable. And generally there's two types of variables. One is a, um, a control chart that measures the mean value, which is an X-bar chart. And the other is a control chart that measures some sort of variability in the samples that you're taking. And there's two kinds of those, the R and the S. Generally, we use an R chart. Most people use R charts, but we can use an S chart. So the X is for monitoring the means, and the R and the S is for monitoring the variability, and we usually use an R chart. And these are just generally the equations. If you remember from the previous video, what we have is we have a center line, which is going to be the average. So for an X, X chart, it'll be the X bar bar, or the average of the average of the samples. And then the upper control limit and the lower control limit are indicated by just taking um, A2, and, um, A2 for a X bar and multiplying it by the range. Um, and then you add and subtract from that. And the book goes into the derivations of the A2 and the D3 and D4. Um, but these are values that you can just look up in a standard control chart table. Um, so let's look at an example. Generally, when we do a variable control chart, we use the R first. We calculate the R value first. Um, and in this case, we have this table. This is an example from the book where we took samples. We took 25 samples of five wafer thicknesses in microns. These are in microns. And so you can see for the first sample, we took these five values. And we calculated from that sample an average, an X bar and a range, which is really just the highest minus the lowest value. And then we did that for 25 samples and got a total, an average average, this is the X bar bar, and an average range. Um, and so in, on page two, 720 in the book, you can look up these values. So we look up a D4 and a D3, and the, the equations are we're going to take the D4 value times the average range, which is this value, and the D3 for the lower control limit times the range. So for the upper control limit from the table, we look up this value. We just multiply it by that value to get the upper control li limit on the range at 0.6874. The lower control limit, you can see the D3 is 0, so the lower control limit is just going to be 0. We, then we do this also for the X bar chart. Now often these two control charts are used together. We don't just monitor only mean and only range. We do them often together. So the equations are we take the X bar bar, which is this, that X, the averages of the X bars, and then we multiply it by A2 times the um, range. Oh no, that should be A2. Hope you can correct that. That should be A2. Um, so when we do that, is we take the mean value, this, plus the A2 value is 0 0.770 times the um, R, the average of the ranges, and we get these a lower and upper lower control limit. Now I want you to indicate that, remember, this is phase one of the calculations, which is establishing the control limits. So now what we've just done is we just have a blank control chart, one of X bar and one of R. Um, and these bar, these charts should be periodically revised. And there is a methodology in the book that talks about how to revise this. But this is just the beginning point, and then we start um, recording samples on that. Um, another thing that's kind of interesting about a control chart is it's completely separate from the specifications of the process. So, but it can, when we have some understanding of these upper and lower control limits, we can use that to have some indication of, is our process even capable of um, falling within this, falling within the um, required specifications for the customers? So let's say in this process, we'll just uh, extend this um, example a little bit, and say that the um, process needs to be the specifications from the customers are that it needs to be 1.5 microns plus or minus 0.5. So it needs to be between 1 and 2 microns, this particular process. So we want to know what's the proportion of non-conforming wafers that are produced in this process. 
another way of saying that is what's the probability that the results will be outside of the area between 1 and 2 microns, given what we know about the average and the standard deviation of the samples. So we know that the, um, the, the sigma hat, or the standard deviation of the sample, is um, r bar over d2. And the d2, again, is a value we can look up in the sample charts, which means that the standard deviation is 0.1398. The x bar, which was from that other um, slide, the, the x bar bar, actually that should be x bar bar, um, is 1.5056. So we want to know what's the probability of both the x's being above 2 microns and a value being below 1, right, between 1 and 2, given that we have this standard deviation and this sample size. So we take, we calculate a z value of that, and we can say what's the probability of z being greater than that or z being less than that, which is greater than 3.536 or less than minus 3.616. And we can add that together <clears throat> and see that the probability of um, this being sort of our process making a part that is not conforming to the customer specifications are 0 0.0035. That's pretty good. That, that means that about 3.5 in um, 10,000 won't conform, which is not that many. Um, again, there's also something, we'll look at this a little bit later, but I wanted to um, bring this up. The process capability ratio, which is the upper control, upper, not control limit, but other specification limit and the lower specification limit over six sigma, which is the plus or minus three standard deviations. And we want this value to be above one. So the specifications are one to two, that was what we said it was going to be, and six times the sigma, which is 0.398, if you remember from that last, gives us a 1.192. Um, um, process capability, which is a good value. Another way of saying this is that um, the percentage of time that it will be within plus or minus six standard deviations is 83%, which is also pretty good. So now we have a variable control chart. Um, and it's important to remember that the relationship between the upper and lower con control limits have nothing to do with the tolerances specified by the customer or by the process. It's, it's important to know that, that these values are statistically derived. They're not derived by the requirements of a customer. So designing the sample size, designing a control chart itself, looking at what's the sample size, what are the control limits, the frequency of samples, a rational subgroup, which is um, something that's talked about in the book, it all has to do with the economics of this. Um, what, is the, what is the cost of, a, um, of sampling versus the cost of an error going through? Um, so just for, this just finishes this quick video on variability, um, variable control charts. There's a lot more um, information in the book that you might want to look at, but these are the generals. So generally an X bar and an R chart are something that can be measured as opposed to counted.